you so much for okay thanks so much for for joining us today and good morning to some of you and good evening to others and i really appreciate those who are taking uh, making the effort to to rise up early or stay up late to join us today it's, it's great to have you all so this is um this is the boundary system task team an opc led task team satellite activity for the UN Ocean Decade, and it's called Designing Observing System for Ocean Boundary. I would like to, to pass a very warm welcome to our speakers, Dr. Maria Cavano, Dr. Masami Nonaka, and Dr. Marcelo Passaro, who are joining us today across very different, very different time zones. So thank you, and we appreciate you being us, with us today. Um, so my name is Marjolaine Krug. I'm a physical oceanographer working at the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment, and I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm also the chair of the Boundary System Task Team, who's organizing this event. And uh, our main goals today really is to report on what we've been doing in the last year or so as a team, and also to invite uh, further input and courage discussion amongst the uh, different uh, scientists and the community. So today I'll be uh, moderating with the support of uh, Dr. Belen Martin Miguez. Uh, if you can just wave, Belen. <laughs> Hi. You know who you are. And also uh, uh, Forrest Collins from UNESCO, but she, she's um, hiding there behind the goose, uh, <laughs> the goose uh, logo. Um, so we also have a, a panel of experts who will support us with, uh, with the discussions. So I would like to welcome uh, also all the panelists. And if, uh, if that's okay, I would like to just ask the panelists to quickly um, introduce themselves so the audience is able to, to see who is here. Can we please start with Tammy Morris? Dr. Tamarin Morris. And Tammy, if you don't mind, you can just uh, pass on the, the microphone to the person after you on the panel. Thank you. May I say something you before we go on? Sorry to interrupt, but just because um, I would like to remind the participants, this is a, a normal Zoom meeting, not a webinar. So we can't uh, easily um control your microphone so i'd like to ask you to to uh, mute if you are not muted some of you are not muted yet so please uh, check that and mute yourselves and also uh, you've probably seen it already but this meeting is being recorded so that uh, that's for for your information thanks thank you thank um you. yes tammy go ahead my name is Dr. Tamarin Morris. I'm a senior scientist at uh, the Marine Unit in the South African Weather Service. And we've worked extensively in the Agulhas Current region. And I'm very happy to be joining you today. I'd like to pass on to Maria, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Abe, if you want to uh, come in uh, with a, a comment or. Um, we, we're just introducing the panelists so far, um, and please just don't, um, so just a few rules. I was going to talk about that later. So to prevent interference, I would ask to ask you, the participant, to please keep your microphone muted and your cameras off. Um, if at any stage you want to ask questions for technical uh, issues, you can put that in the chat, and Belen or Forrest will try to assist you. If uh, at any stage in the meeting you want to ask questions, you can simply raise your hand or ask a question uh, using the chat functionality. And once you raise your hand, then Belen will, will um, come and, and give you the floor so you can express your <coughs> and then speak out. But otherwise, for the, the sake of keeping this uh, meeting uh, more organized, we ask that you please mute yourself and keep your cameras off. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let's start again <laughs> with the panel introductions. We've just been through Tammy and now Maria Paz, if you could please briefly introduce yourself to you. Yeah, thank you, Melena Marjolaine. So my name is Maria Paz Chichimo. I am a physical oceanographer. 
working in the Argentine Scientific Council and the Hydrographic Service in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So I am mainly an in situ. Mm -hmm. Maria, we've lost you, you muted. Oh, shall I start again? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, just, just keep so, just very briefly. So, yes, my name is Maria Pacci Chimo. I am a physical oceanographer uh, working in the Argentine Scientific Council and the Hydrographic Service in Buenos Aires, Argent Argentina. And my main interests are in in situ marine arrays, uh, studying Western boundary currents and MOC. So, I pass to the next panelist. Thank you. Hi, I'm Song Young Kim. Uh, I'm a faculty member in Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm a coastal oceanographer and working on some scale process and coastal ocean tripping system. Thank you. Who's next, please? I'll go. Um, I'm Ed Dever. I'm at Oregon State University in the USA. I'm a physical oceanographer working with the United States Ocean Observatories Initiative. And um, I'll pass it over to you, Janet. Oh, thanks, Ed. I'm Janet Sprintle. I'm a physical oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, I'm interested primarily in uh, Pacific Western Boundary Currents and lower latitude Western Boundary Currents. And I'm a seagoing observational oceanographer. And I'll pass that over to Kiyoshi Tanaka. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, my name is Kiyoshi Tanaka from Japan. I am a physical oceanographer. My experts are uh, physical pr uh, processes of exchange, uh, shelf, shelf, basin ex uh, shelf basin exchange, and coastal circulation and crucial current. Thank you so much. So hello, my name is Nadia Ayub. I'm a research scientist in Toulouse, working on coastal ocean dynamics and uh, altimetry as well. So I'm interested in um, the French coast in the Northeast Atlantic and in the South China Sea. Thank you. Okay, so my, my name is Xin Yuko, and I, ask, I also come from Japan in Aichimi University. So my, actually my top, my risk topic is crucial and it's a, it's a interaction with shelf uh, region. So yeah, I'm also interested in nutrient transport and some other related issue. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, we've gone through the panel and a bit more actually. <laughs> so we'll stop there. And um, let's, let's carry on just uh, before we start with our talks. I just want to summarize a little bit. Um, I'm going to share the agenda with you all. Belen, do you want to share it? Should I share it? Maybe be easier. I'm going to share the agenda. All right. Are you able to see the agenda there? Hello. Can you see the agenda, yes. everyone? We can see okay, it. Great. Thank you. All right. So we we will have uh, four presentations today, including uh, my one, and um, the, each presentation is fifteen minutes. And after the presentation, I think what we'll do is we'll keep all the questions until all the presentations are done. And then after the presentation, you as participants, you can raise your hand, ask a question in the chat. And then uh, we'll let our speakers uh, respond. And following that, we will be um, uh, proceeding with the discussion. Okay, um, if you have any issues, as I said, please use the chat box and, uh, and ask Belen and, and Forrest to assist you. And you're welcome to put your questions in the chat box as well at any time. Thanks. Um, and I think maybe, uh, at the end of this, or even now, we could, uh, Belen, I don't know if you had an opportunity to, to get a quick picture of the participants, but uh, it would be nice to have a group photo. <laughs> so, 
So I don't know how you all feel, but if you could just briefly just um, share our, our camera and just have a, a group photo and say hello to everyone. Okay, just one second. Okay, I have it. Thanks, Belen. Thank you, everyone. All right, then. So without further ado, I'm going to proceed with my presentation. Um, let me just share. All right. Belen, are you able to see this? Um, Not yet. Maybe I must. We promise we, we were taking all this beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes as low. Okay, here it is. Yes. Thanks for your patience. Okay, let's get going. Um, so, yes, one of the main objectives of today's event is for, for the Boundary System Task Team to give you some feedback on what we've been busy with over the last year or so. And so this is what I will present now. And as mentioned before, the BSTT is an OOPC-led task team which aims to provide guidance on the deployment of observing assets at ocean boundaries and in support of the global ocean observing system. So what we aim to do is to guide observing system requirements Oh, Belen, you muted me. I am sorry. I wanted to. There was a noise, and I was trying to find out where it was coming from because there are people that are not. Just bear with me one second. I'm going to mute everybody, and then you unmute yourself and you go on, please. Uh, okay, so that we don't have this uh, because it's difficult for me to go muting people individually. So I mute everything, everybody now, and then you go on and you unmute yourself. Okay, I do it now. Okay, sorry, let's try to proceed now. All right, so what, what we aim to do in the BSTT is to guide observing system requirements for ocean boundaries to link the global observing system to regional coastal systems. And we focus first on resolving the physics and also on, uh, on mid-latitude systems. We also want to promote conversations and collaborations between modeling and observing communities towards better observing system design. And we would like to, uh, you know, seek community consensus on coordinated approaches to global boundary systems for collaboration um, with others in this space, such as uh, Kiva, Ocean Predict. And of course, there are many very interesting uh, UN Ocean Decade programs that we would like to interact with. Um, another thing that we'd like to do is to promote uh, the development of uh, sustained uh, ocean observing system. Uh, by encouraging reviews or pilot experiments, um, system evaluation experiments, and generally being an advocate for, for new sustained observing activities. So this is the composition of the team at the moment. Uh, we are an international team with a, a very uh, different diverse uh, geographic uh, regions covered. And also we're trying to have a good uh, balance of, uh, of between uh, male and female of gender, you know, to try to be uh, diversified both in, in regions and kind of people we have in the team and the expertise. We have had a few, um, a couple of members leave us recently, and uh, we might need to identify new people to help us in our efforts with the team. So what have you been doing recently? Um, so what we decided to do is to first look at uh, deriving knowledge from mature observing system. 
And because of the challenges associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, we've uh, basically had to adopt a virtual strategy. And so what we've done is we've embarked on a series of uh, virtual dialogue events where we bring experts in both ocean observing and ocean modeling to review a specific ocean boundary system. So uh, the way we have done it is that we've asked uh, each expert uh, coming into the, the virtual dialogue um, to provide a 20 minute presentation and address a number of, of themes um, such as uh, you know, the description of the system, the mix of plat platform used, the users of the system discussing model limitation and how models are using the observation, talking about the lessons learned and providing recommendations. So each of the presentation was, was guided by uh, specific questions around these themes. And this allowed us to, 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 to have a, a more um, unified view of the different systems and an uh, easier way to report and, and collate the information at the end of it. So the output from these virtual dialogues will be used to, to develop a synthesis of best practices and to inform the implementation and development of observing system at ocean boundaries. So we started, uh, we launched the, the webinars, a series of webinars in May this year. And uh, we started with the Abelian system, which was uh, presented to us by uh, Dr. Enrique Alvarez Fanjou. And he did both the observing and modeling component. And then this was followed by California Current. So every month after that, we've had a, a webinar. And so far, we've covered uh, four systems. So we're trying you know, to, to cover different, different systems uh, in the dynamics and in the regions so that by the end, we have a, quite a comprehensive views of, of different systems and we can provide recommendations that can apply to, to many other systems in the world. So, so far we've done the Abelian system, the California current, the Pure Ratio current, the East Australian current. And next month we will do the Gulf Stream. <clears throat> and then uh, this will be followed the month after by a review on the Mediterranean system. We haven't quite decided exactly uh, on that one yet, but um, um, the ones that we have done so far, they all, uh, the presentation done by the experts are all available online and can be downloaded, uh, as well as the webinar itself, which is an hour discussion. And you can access them through the, the Bruce webpage, or you can even just Google it and, and find it on YouTube. So it's all in the public domain. I want to thank, you know, it's been a really, really interesting. And I, I really want to thank all the presenters who have um, helped us in the webinars and have prov provided uh, excellent presentations. And some of their slides or, or pictures from their slide are used in, in this presentation as well. So, um, one of the things we looked at is the establishment of the observing systems. And we found that all, of, all the systems we've reviewed so far um, are funded pretty much exclusively by, or primarily by government. And they were established uh, using a, a mixture of uh, top-down and bottom-up approaches. Um, some observing system grew from individual science projects or in response to particular problems or need. Uh, for example, in the California current system, the system was initially established in response to the collapse of the, the sardine fisheries. Um, for example, also in the Iberian system, it's the needs of the, the, the port authorities for high resolution uh, current and wave forecast, which is uh, the main motivation for the observing system. The Iberian system really stood out uh, in comparison to all the others we, we reviewed because um, in this case, it was really uh, driven exclusively by the post authorities and, and they fund all the observations. And uh, the benefits of course, uh, of the observing system extends far beyond the, the, the ports, uh, the needs for the, from the ports, but, um, but it is uh, the main user of the system. And therefore a lot of the observations are in response to their requirements. 
And in most systems, the, the physics component was implemented first with uh, biology and biogeochemistry coming later. So who are the users of the, of the systems? And uh, often the main users are also the main funders of the system. And we find that uh, essentially uh, the primary users are really in government. Um, they, they, are, they are usually in institutes such as the fisheries, you know, for search and rescue operation, uh, meteorological agencies, supporting uh, marine spatial planning or marine protection for the marine protected areas, management, etc. And of course, uh, one of the main user system is uh, the science groups and the operational communities, the modelers who use the observation both uh, in hincast uh, for, for hincast or forecast. And they use historical uh, observation to validate their model or uh, look at long-term viability in the model, or they, they just use uh, observations to assimilate in the models. But we find that uh, in, in most cases, uh, with the exception of the Abelian system uh, review, that in general, th there's little systematic accounting of who the end user groups are. So the communities that are uh, maintaining the system, both the observing and modeling community have a good idea of who their primary users are, but they don't really know what, what, what the end users group uh, look like. So in terms of the, the design, um, the systems are generally include a mix of uh, different observation. Um, they, they use uh, measuring platforms such as uh, moorings, mooring arrays, gliders. Um, they use the global uh, data that's available through Argo or satellite data. SSH and SST are, are used extensively across all systems. And uh, these uh, surface observations are, you know, are complemented by vertical profiles through, through CTD, XVT, and ship sampling as well. And the science questions, they're very, very much dependent on the requirements from the users. And uh, in some instances, in some instances, sorry, such as the California current, multiple system design uh, are designed to, to different stakeholders requirements. Um, so one of the things that was identified in the Croatia is that sometimes uh, the requirements of the user changes, and so so do the measurements. For example, they had uh, a focus, the fish, you know, they, they had uh, some uh, government focus first on pollution and pollution uh, linked measurements were priority. And then the, the, the focus changed to fisheries. And so different measurements uh, took place. So this can cause issues in terms of the coordination and the continuity of the observations. And of course, uh, the design is dependent on the, on the oceanography of the regions with uh, different variability or, or calling for, for different measurement techniques. And of course, accessibility is also a driver of the design. So there is not one system that has it all. <laughs> they all have gaps, uh, spatial and temporal. In the, in the East Australian current, you know, the, there was a mention that the southern part of the current is, is not very well covered. Um, but there's also gaps in the methodologies um, of you know, the use of modern methods, which is not really uh, taking place in some regions as well, or that the observations aren't really exploited yet um, by the modern community. The one thing that all systems have in common, or this mature system, is that very strong um, data management foundation. Essentially, you know, the, the effectiveness of the observing system is, is reliant about, upon a very strong data uh, repository and management systems uh, where you have access to open data and you have uh, reliable data uploads and it's easy to, to access and operate and download and, and use to, 
to implement into your, your models. Uh, for this, you also need uh, the systems to be compatible with each other. Uh, you need good uh, quality control, consistency in the metadata. And uh, one of the way in which uh, these uh, data systems are used is for real-time display, early warning systems, and, and on occasion, the uh, value-added products. So how the observations used, um, I've actually talked a little bit about this, but essentially it's model validation um, and assimilation for the modeling community. The, the mooring arrays, the boys and the ship's observation are generally used for model validation, as well as all the delayed, uh, delayed time satellite information. And uh, data simulation models, they have requirements for routine and easily accessible observations. Uh, such site like the CMEMS TAC site is, is very useful. And uh, the, the one that are mostly used for simulation in models are sea surface height, sea surface temperature, Argo. And with a note that HF radar is actually proving to be very useful in co coastal regions. There's also, uh, there was notes that to properly resolve the mesoscale processes in the assimilated uh, ocean models, you need to combine uh, both uh, surface and vertical observation to capture you know, the thermal client structure of the, of the currents. In the crew ratio, they have done this by combining altimetry with acoustic tomography. And in other regions uh, of, the, of the world, they're using gliders. And uh, the use of deep gliders is especially impactful to, to resolve things like uh, mesoscale eddies. Um, in the East Australian current, some, some uh, modeling uh, experiments have shown that, or analysis have shown that the impact of the observation is actually uh, higher in a region with a higher uh, natural viability. And another thing that was also noted in, in Australia is that sometimes there's a disparity in the number of observation available for, for vertical profiles compared to the surface observation, which are routinely observed by the satellite. And this can cause uh, problems in the representation of the vertical structure in the models. So it's something to, to look at. So, some of the, the successes are that, you know, the models, thanks to the, the models and assimilated data models, they've been able to show that you actually, you really need a mix of surface, subsurface and vertical observation to adequately um, resolve, you know, mesoscale viability or, or capture the current structure. What it also shows is that, um, even if your observation don't cover the whole system, you know, they have a, an impact that reaches far beyond the area which is being measured. So this is a, both a upstream and downstream and, and uh, forward and backwards in time. So this is very encouraging and really shows the value of, of measuring things. Um, and then um, there's a demonstrated impact in, in all instances of of the improvement of the forecast uh, when uh, observations are assimilated into the models. And also the, the modeling, you know, they've, they've managed to, to understand, uh, thanks to the observation and the validation of the model, like get better understanding of long-term viability as well, natural viability, which is, which is great. So one of these uh, examples of success is, uh, for example, is in the, the Iberian system, which we said is focused on the ports, where they have managed to downscale um, from, from the CMEMS uh, model outputs all the way down to really harbor scale. And they, they provide a you know, forecast of of waves and of currents, uh, which are extremely valuable for the port authorities in terms of the movement of the ships inside the harbor. So to have been able to achieve this is, is really a, um, a good success and a demonstration of how, um, you know, having 
having an observing system can really uh, improve the regional models and then allows instant scaling. Um, another, another really, uh, I think, uh, interesting thing that I found out, I found from the Pure Ratio presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Miyazawa was they couldn't deploy gliders in the regions because of the lot of fishing activities and too many nets. And so what they have done is through increased collaboration with the fisheries, they have designed this, uh, this CTD, uh, very simple CTD uh, sensor that the, the ships can use. And this information is actually relayed in, in real time through the data servers to the uh, assimilating uh, model, modeling community. And they're able to use these observations to improve uh, their predictions, which is great. So in terms of, of recommendations that we have identified so far, one of the main recommendation um, coming from the, the user of the system is to, to engage early with stakeholders in the process. And also, because often we're not able to account who is using the observation, it would be very valuable to, um, to track how the data is used, the downloads, and uh, that would help also in, in accurately estimating the value of the observing system. Um, and one way in which to do that, you know, is to also demonstrate the value of the observing system is to show um, to the people who provide the, info, the observations, what impacts those observations have on the model. Um, there's, you know, dealing with stakeholders and finding out what their requirements are is something that takes a lot of time and requires good communication skills. Um, and so I think, it's quite essential to have some resources uh, and capacity identified to communicate with stakeholders and, and ensure that there's proper engagement and participation and hopefully funding as well in the long term to help the sustainability of the system. Another recommendation that came was to, to also allocate resources to move beyond data towards data products and value added products that can directly speak to the users. And of course, um, government funding is, is key as well to ensure cohesion and sustainability of the system in the long term and make sure that the system is not just focused on one specific user's requirement, but can also be uh, accommodating all other aspects um, of the ocean that we're interested in. Um, in terms of the in terms of the observations, um, what has come out is that you need, you need a, a lot of uh, skills in data dissemination, data portals, data product, open data policy. Um, we need to improve the coordination amongst the funders of the observing system to ensure continuity in the, in the observation and better design. One thing that came out in all of the presentations was the, uh, the need for, for better, better understanding of the SC fluxes uh, processes and interactions, which is a key limiting factor for the modern community. And this is why um, we're looking, I'm looking, really looking forward to, to the presentation by Dr. Masami Nanaka later on in this uh, meeting. And we need to devise strategy to really to secure long-term sustained observation, which are essential for the, the monitoring of the climate. And this is, this is a really big, um, it's, it's not easy to motivate for uh, long-term mooring arrays to be sustained and something that we need to, to um, you know, really communicate well to funders on the use of these observation climate studies. Um, the one thing that is also come out is that you need a mix of surface and subsurface measurements to improve the representation of eddies in the risk of processes and models. And that uh, models are essential part of the design uh, that must be used to inform the design strategy. And we need more uh, observation impact experiments. 
So as I said, yeah, SC flux is, is, is a major challenge for the models. And one of the recommendations was to that uh, observing system and modeling system uh, aiming to provide services to really have uh, downscaling of the atmosphere enforcing to, to allow better representation of the wind fields. The Aberian system also said that it was much very useful to have access to higher temporal resolution from the global models rather than just a daily, uh, the daily output that is provided typically from uh, Copernicus. Uh, also, the ensemble model solution was always better than the individual solution. So the need to, to run several models is, is there. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it would be good to have stronger collaborations between uh, open ocean and coastal water modeling communities. Uh, the two don't necessarily always talk to each other. And hopefully this is something that, that can be addressed also in the coast predict of the UN program that's, that has been approved. And uh, one interesting thing in terms of, of the, the system was that um, in the Abelian system, they identified that you actually needed separate computing environments for different purposes, one for, for development, one for pre-production, and one for production. And that they found that the outsourcing of these uh, operational, uh, the maintenance of these computer systems, uh, 24 hours and seven days a week, was better done through uh, private contracting, actually. And one recommendation as well is for more research in data simulation, uh, looking at new data streams and improving the data simulation scheme in the models. So I just wanted to finish with this um, because I thought it was really nice example of where things might move in the future. Um, that was also provided during uh, Dr. Miyazawa's presentation where they're looking at now at, uh, at using uh, biologging data to assimilate into the model. Thank you so much. I'm not sure how to <laughs> stop my presentation, but then can you stop it? We can move to the next speaker, please. You should be able to stop sharing your screen on the, on the top. You should see a bar somewhere, but otherwise I will try to do it. it just only gives me the option to, to share. <laughs> ah, yes, yeah. no, I got it. Okay, thanks. Okay, and we'll move on to our next speaker, who is, um, I can't remember. Um, agenda. Marcello, I think. Yes, I'm here. Marcello, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I was try sharing the screen. Um, wait a second, share screen. And then I share this one. Okay. Um, okay. So can you see the screen and hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So uh, yes. So thanks a lot um, for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Marcello Bassaro, and I'm a research scientist at the uh, Technical University of Munich in an institute called uh, the German Geodetic Institute. And um, so my background is a mixture between remote sensing scientists, uh, engineering and oceanography. So um, I mainly deal with um, satellite altimetry and uh, particularly with uh, the application of satellite altimetry in challenging areas for the observations, uh, and in particular, um, the coastal zone, as well as the high latitudes. Um, I've been involved in uh, the uh, coastal altimetry community about which I will tell you in this, uh, um, in this presentation at the end, since the start of my PhD, and that's um, something like uh, 10 years ago almost. And um, so uh, today I'd like to um, give you a little bit uh, um, a sort of overview of the status of the recent, uh, recent advances in the application of satellite altimetry in the coastal zone. And in particular, um, what we are able currently to do in terms of sea level monitoring um, when we get um, close to the coast. 
Um, so uh, if I have to resume this presentation in, uh, in, in one single message, then um, what I'd like to communicate today is that um, it is possible right now, as of today, to get reliable coastal sea level measurement from remote sensing. So this means that the data are already in public data sets. The results are being analyzed and there is already very nice science uh, that is being done with it. Um, so it's not anymore a, a sort of a um, scientific attempt to see if it works also close to the coast, but it's something that we are already using. And uh, the reasons why we could get to this point is that um, there is a number of improvements at different stages about which I will try to summarize something today. Um, so this is in terms of the way we treat the radar eco um, and the adjustments that we have to do uh, to correct for different delays that this radar eco encounters when it goes from the satellite to the sea surface. Um, but also the advances that we have in new technologies or so new ways of using these radars uh, on board of new missions. This is what made possible the status that we have uh, today. Um, Yes, and the picture that you see here is just a scheme to uh, remember what we're talking about. So we are, we have a satellite, we have altimeters on board of satellites, and uh, we send an impulse of energy at Nadir that goes through the atmosphere and then it arrives at the uh, sea and travels back. And so we have to transform this information into sea level. Um, so the first kind of improvements I'd like to mention is the improvement in signal processing, in particular in fitting the signal that we receive, which is a procedure called retracking, because this is made uh, this made available observations that were actually corrected 20 years ago, but were never used at the coast. So we can uh, try to understand what we have been collected. Um, and the reason is that, um, uh, we have been known, uh, this was known since many years, that the uh, signal that we receive conforms to a known model that works um, very well in the open ocean. So you can see uh, here on the top uh, a scheme of this model, but the example that I'm showing you here is from a real signal that we actually see from altimetry. So you see uh, the shape of the signal conforms to a model. Um, but the problem we had to face is that when we get in the coastal zone, um, the area that we are illuminating doesn't have um, as, uh, doesn't have an homogeneous backscatter, but can be instead uh, affected by land intrusion uh, in the footprint or also by areas at different backscatter. So I've put you here a picture that I took at the coast, and then you can see if you imagine you are looking at the circle of an area, a circular area, then you might have effects that change the uh, backscatter. Um, of, of the of the water and this causes um, interference in the signals like the one that you see here that we have to face so we had to improve the way in which we were fitting the signal and uh, we have developed uh, different techniques for doing that um, this made us retrieve signals that were collected in the past but in the meantime right now with new technologies, we are able, in fact, to retrieve uh, more precise and more accurate measurements. And in particular, the, 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 these, uh, this new uh, way of processing signals that we're using, it's the so-called SAR altimetry, which is now on board on several satellites. And therefore, we called all the others that we have been collected up to now the low resolution mode. So why do we do this? Because in fact, right now with SAR altimetry, we are able, um, um, if I have to put it in a simple way, to look at a particular segment of the footprint um, uh, that is illuminated by the satellite and to look at it somehow multiple times. So you exploit this Doppler effect of your uh, satellites going over a target to look at slightly different angle, the same um, um, resolution cell. Um, and this means that somehow the energy that you are uh, receiving um, um, from the periphery of the signal is not wasted, but it's focused and nadir. The effect of this is that we can increase the signal to noise ratio, ratio of the parts of the signal that interest us for sea level retrieval, which is the so-called DD gauge. 
And there are new developments about which I won't talk today because the data sets are not yet uh, available, uh, which is a further development of this, which is called fully focused SAR, um, which will help us even more to increase the precision of, of what we're seeing. Um, just to spend a couple of words more on this, um, you can see here in this sketch the kind of footprint that is illuminated by the altimeter. And you can see that when we have a Doppler treatment of the signal, so when we have the so-called SAR altimetry, we focus our observation on one particular segment of this footprint. And the consequence is that, as you can see, this leading edge is uh, much more defined than in the case of, uh, um, uh, of the low resolution mode um, altimetry. Um, as well, the along track resolution is being um, proved. It's now um, um, uh, beam limited along the track. So we focus on one particular segment of this circle. Um, and I will come back to that in terms of consequences as on, of how precisely we are able to deliver sea level data now. Um, but another thing I'd like to say from the signal point of view is that you have seen before we have this energy traveling through the atmosphere. And one of the main problems that we have to face in terms of these adjustments that we have to do because of the presence of the atmosphere um, was that um, we have to uh, deal with the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere, which changes very rapidly and also at small uh, spatial scales. And in the open ocean, we could do this on board. We can do this on board um, using radiometers. But this kind of measurements are, again, also suboptimal in the coastal zone, mainly due to the land interference. But meanwhile, in these latest years, we have seen the development of more modern methods that um, combine um, a better way to detect the outliers that tell us that this is a wrong uh, correction with the fact that we are combining radiometer measurements with model data and with in situ measurements from GNSS stations that measure uh, the uh, um, wet delay in the atmosphere. Um, so the consequence is that um, what you can see here, it's um, the measurement of uh, improvement of the sea level anomaly data. So it's the sea level anomaly variance difference versus the distance from the coast um, and essentially this one of these methods that is called the GPD plus corrections when applying is showing that uh, the sea level variance difference using this method compared to the radiometer one shoots up in the last 20 to 30 kilometers from the coast. And this is because that's where the improvement of this method in fact is coming from. So we can increase notably the uh, um, precision of our sea level measurements in this uh, last 30 kilometers. But what does it mean to get more precise and why is this useful for users of sea level data? So uh, if you have ever used a measurement from an, from, uh, from an along track altimetry rather than a grid of sea level points, um, you might have seen that these measurements are usually distributed at one hertz. It means you have uh, an average of sea level measurements every seven kilometers along the track. But in fact, usually the retracking process, so this fitting of the waveform happens at a higher frequency, typically at 20 Hertz. So you have one waveform that is retracted every, every more or less 300 meters along the track. So especially for uh, the studies at the coast or at the boundaries, probably this kind of frequency would be more interesting, but of course it's more affected by noise if you want to go at the scales. Um, but thanks to what I've shown you and through these uh, new technologies, we are considerably reducing the so-called 20 hertz range noise. So we are improving the precision with which we can uh, provide sea level measurements at 20 hertz. And currently, we are at about 5 centimeters of precision in standard ocean conditions at 20 hertz. Um, and this is improving even more. So uh, in this plot that I've taken from a presentation, um, you can see um, measurements from the Sentinel-3 satellites uh, treated in two different ways. And you can see in the green curve that the latest developments are managing to keep this precision high, also in case of high significant wave height conditions, which was not the case before. And 
well, you can tell better than I can tell why this could be interesting. And I taken this slide um, that uses uh, one of these data sets that is already available at 20 Hertz, which is the sea level, the regional product of the sea level climate change initiative from the European Space Agency. And you can see here, in this case, um, the colleagues have derived um, uh, the velocity, so they have taken the derivative of the, uh, of the sea level along different tracks at different cycles. And you see here on, my, on the left side what happens when you use one hertz data versus what happens when you use 20 hertz data. So you can see that this can be maybe a way to better characterize something like a coastal current and its variability. Since when you use one hertz data, you're essentially missing several points when getting a very um, I hear background noise or somebody speaking, but uh, I'll carry on. Um, so now I'd like to show you some of the science we're doing uh, with that. So just let's, let's, let's leave the way in which we acquire this measurement and see what we can do with them. And I think one particularly interesting improvement for sea level science is how we can um, measure or correct for tides in the coastal zone. Um, so as everybody of you know, the estimation of tides in the coastal zone and already in the shed seas, it's much more complicated than in the open ocean. Um, so I'm showing you here a comparison against tide gauges um, of uh, different uh, tidal models. And you can see that the residual sum of square, so the discrepancy between the tide models and the estimation from in situ data, it's very small in the open ocean, but it grows in the shed seas. And it used to grow even more when getting close to the coastal zone, which in this case is defined as shallower than 10 meters depth. But you can see that, for example, these two models here stand out because they managed to considerably improve this discrepancy. And what are the ways in which we are able to improve, uh, to reduce this discrepancy? I'll mention two of them. One is the fact that modern um, um, the tidal models uh, um, are using much higher resolution region, much higher resolution regional meshes, and they are using where possible improved bathymetry, which is possible then uh, through improved bathymetry to uh, increase uh, the performances of the um, modeling of the tides in the coastal zone. And the other way is that if you want to use altimetry itself to then improve the tidal model, then by using um, improved uh, sea level measurements with the techniques I've shown you before, then it has been demonstrated that you can always improve or almost always improve the results of tidal estimation in particular in the last 10 kilometers, as you can see here with this, all these red dots uh, compared to the blue dots. Um, so tides is one way in which we are um, mm -hmm using this, uh, in, uh, this data from coastal altimetry. But another very important application um, uh, that I think summarizes a little bit the progresses that I've started up to now is the fact that we are starting to be able to measure sea level trends right at the coast. And this means also, of course, that you could do this in area where you don't have, for example, tide gauges. Um, or you can observe the gradients of the sea level rather than just computing it at the point as in the tide gauge case. So I'd like to cite the study that was done by a large group of scientists and was recently published in Nature Scientific Data, in which for the first time coastal sea level trends were estimating uh, as close as possible to the coast using a long track at the coastal altimetry and compared to a same measurement taken 15 kilometers away. So actually still very close. Um, and I've selected a couple of plots out of this study. So this is done regionally because the, it, this product is associated with this regional um, ESA climate change initiative product, which is nevertheless almost now covering the entire world, coastal uh, world. Um, but you see uh, here a number of selected trucks, and in particular, the estimations of the coastal sea level trend. And you can see the typical picture of increasing trends um, at different uh, um, levels, and also somehow a coherency of the signal that you're seeing at different regions. Um, but I think what is interesting here um, to observe is also how close could we get 
to the coast to measure the sea level trend, which is um, um, shown here. So you can see that this, of course, depends on the um, on the on the on the trucks, and this is because uh, different approaches to the coast or different configuration of the coast might change the quality of the measurements that you have. But in many of these points, we are now being able to observe the coastal trend at the zero to two kilometer distance, or at least up to uh, six kilometer from the coast. Um, this is a very large improvement compared to the usual way of saying that we're using up to 10 years ago, saying that altimetry could not be used up to 30 kilometers from the coast or something like this. Um, and when you then start comparing what happens as close as possible to the beach with respect to 15 kilometers away, then uh, we had this important result, I think, in which we were showing, uh, we were trying to give an answer of whether the sea level trend in the altimetry era, so in the last 25 years, would be different at the coast with respect to just farther away. And in 80% of the studies side, studied sites, this was not the case, at least within plus minus um, one millimeter per year, which is an important result because you, it means that on a very large number of sites, imagine that you have predictions of sea level trend done by modeling, then you can say, well, despite my model has uh, this particular grid size, I can take for granted that this is also, um, at least in the space of two decades, the sea level trend that, that I will see also right at the coast. But don't forget that in 20% of the studied sites, this was not the case. And so a lot of colleagues and me including were working a lot in trying to understand which kind of small scale processes can affect the sea level trend right at the coast within this time scale of a couple of decades. So that's a very interesting line of study, I think. Um, so of course I had to select um, some of the sciences that we're doing with coastal altimetry, but I think it's a very exciting time for the community because um, we are not anymore only working on improving the signal and, and, and trying to somehow give some preliminary data set, but we're working now with data sets that are really at the focus of big projects. So I mentioned already the sea level climate change initiative, but also the sea state climate change initiative of the European Space Agency currently are focusing also on the coast in terms of the data set that they are releasing. Uh, I will invite, I would like to conclude by inviting you to visit the uh, um, community or the website that hosts a lot of material of this community, yeah. of the meetings that we have had in the last um, more than a decade, in fact, and very precious training courses done in the last year. And I've put here a link of the latest review articles that contain some of the novelties that uh, I've shown you here today, although meanwhile it's already out of date, in fact. And I'll leave it here. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, we'll carry on with our uh, third presentation by um, Dr. Masami Nonaka. Thank you. And the questions we'll keep at the end of all the presentations. Dr. Nonaka, if you may share your screen, thanks. Hey, can you see me? Uh, yes, can... you just need to go to full full screen mode, presentation mode. Yeah. But it's perfect Does otherwise. It work? Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, yeah, thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, thank you very much for giving us today uh, this opportunity to show our activities. Uh, so today I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the recent Fiber workshop and uh, our Japanese project for the Mid-Latitude Airship Interactions. I'm Masami Nonaka from uh, Jamstech, Japan. And uh, I'm not an uh, expert of the ocean observation that today I'd like to introduce some recent uh, topics of mid-latitude air interaction to see the uh, possible impact of coastal ocean to the atmosphere. So uh, collaborating with uh, the Climate Dynamics Panel, uh, recently in June, we had an international workshop 
or middle latitude ESC interactions. And uh, uh, this workshop was sponsored by our hot spot, climatic hotspot to project, as uh, we showed here. And uh, so first, I'd like to uh, introduce, but uh, what is the climatic hotspot and uh, our project briefly? So uh, here, uh, this plot showed a uh, uh, surface uh, heat flux from the ocean to the atmosphere uh, in January. So here we can see huge amount of heat release from the ocean to the atmosphere in the Western Boundary Current regions. Now we call these regions as climatic hotspots. The key regions for mid-latitude ESC interactions. Actually, uh, their impact on climate have been shown by accumulated studies, including those by our first climate hotspot project in 2010 to 15, led by Professor Hisashi Nakamura. And now uh, we have the Climatic Hotspot 2 project in Japan from 2019. And in this project, we will further our understandings of middle latitude S interactions. And also, based on this, we investigate predictability of extreme weather and climate. And also uh, active roles of mid-latitude oceans in projection of climate changes. So you can see the details of our project on this website. And we have uh, more than 70 collaborators. And uh, this is rather a nationwide project in Japan. Okay, so anyway, uh, we had uh, uh, this international climate workshop for middle latitude air interaction in June. So due to the current uh, situation of COVID-19, uh, we had this meeting as an online meeting. But with that uh, system, uh, we had uh, many uh, participants, especially the early career, early career researchers and the students. So um, we had uh, uh, 126 presentations from 14 countries. And also uh, we had uh, 188 participants, including 67 early career researchers and students. In this uh, workshop, we had a two days of session and also two and a half days oral sessions. So in addition to the plenary session, we had a three sub sessions. And uh, uh, based on the uh, time scales of the phenomena, uh, and uh, the first one, first session, uh, session one was for the one day to a few weeks time scale, including extreme events. And the session two and three are for more longer time scale phenomena. And of course, the session one is more closely related to the regional and climb coastal uh, ocean atmospheric ocean atmosphere, variability, and interactions. And here, uh, I'd like to show uh, several uh, titles of talks in the session one. And here we can see uh, many uh, key words for 
with actually air interactions, like uh, atmospheric rivers, explosive bomb cyclones, and moisture sources and moisture transport, extreme, uh, extreme precipitation and uh, heavy snowfall, and a uh, uh, simulation of bomb cyclone with high distribution models. And also uh, here, I'd like to uh, introduce this particular topic, the uh, impact of the closure large meander pass in summertime on the regional climate in Japan. So, As you may know, uh, the cross shear current has uh, two kinds of typical paths to the south of the main island of Japan, the large meander path and also non-large meander path. And Sugimoto et al. 2020 showed that the large uh, cross shear large meander is associated with a westward flow, a westward flowing branch along the main island of Japan around 138 degree east and warm SST in the coastal region here. The Sigimoto et al. 2021 showed with their numerical experiments that the warm SSD can induce warmer surface air temperature in the Kanto district around Tokyo area, the central part of Japan, with enhanced downward long wave radiation with increased water vapor transport from the warm SSD region to that area with the southerly wind in summertime. Next, I'd like to uh, introduce one uh, numerical study related to our climatic hotspot to project. The sensitivity of rainfall to different SST products investigated in the northern part of Japan this is the uh, study by the Izuka and Nakamura 2019. And they brought here the SST field by the so-called MZD SST. And the uh, uh, difference of, difference among the SST products uh, in these other plots. So here we can see that there are substantial differences in the SST mm -hmm. among the SST products due to the, uh, probably due to the different method of analysis to make the grid data. And they investigated sensitivity of heavy rainfall to these SST differences. And they uh, focused on the uh, heavy rainfall event in August uh, 2013. And in this event, we had uh, more than 100 millimeter per hour uh, rainfall in this particular station. And they tried to uh, simulate this event using WARF model and succeeded it. And with this model, they uh, tried to see the impact of to see the impact of the SST difference on the rainfall, and they showed that the area, area mean area average rainfall in this region uh, can depend on the SST averaged in this region as you can see uh, in the top right panel. So warmer SSD can induce the more rainfall here. 
And in addition to that, they showed that the difference of SSD can also affect the location of heavy rainfall, as we can see here. And lastly, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce the, um, one observational study in our hotspot project. Atmospheric observations at isolated islands. So, uh, for improvement of forecast of heavy rainfall, snowfall, improvement of our understandings of lower tropospheric water vapor and its transport over the ocean is crucially important. But its information is still limited. Then we have been conducting continuous atmospheric observation at isolated island like these, whose climate is strongly affected by the ocean to see the uh, water vapor over the ocean. Okay, let me summarize uh, my talk. So recently we had a, a Cliver workshop for metal edge interactions hosted by our hotspot two project in Japan. And we discussed uh, several kinds of important topics. And related to that, here I introduced these three uh, recent research topics. So uh, the first one is the impact of the closure paths on the regional climate through anomalous transport of water vapor. And uh, uh, we have been conducting the uh, observation of water vapor over the ocean, because that is crucially important for understanding prediction of heavy rainfall. Also, uh, one uh, numerical experiment showed a uh, uh, a uh, possible impact of uncertainty of SST products on the heavy rainfall. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, we'll move to our last presentation of this session. And then uh, please don't hesitate to, to, to ask your questions in the chat, we'll pick them. We'll pick on those later. Um, Maria Cavano, if you're able to share your screen now, that'd be great. Thank you to the, the, the two previous presenters. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Frozen. OK. <laughs> Did I freeze? <laughs> we see you received now. Thanks. All right, you can see it now. Um, yeah. Beline, you have these, uh, this presentation if you need to start it. I, I seem to be having some unstable internet um, <laughs> to add to the challenges, um, but hello everyone. I'm Maria Cavanaugh. I'm a researcher at uh, Oregon State University. My background is in seascape ecology and biological oceanography. Um, and I use a lot of um, ocean color remote sensing in my work. Uh, the scope of today's presentation is really a collaborative effort across the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, which includes um, many colleagues, but I'd like to especially acknowledge the effort and leadership of uh, Dr. Frank mueller Carger at the University of South Florida. Um, I pre-recorded my presentation uh, because I'm having some graphics issue, corruption issues this morning, um, but I put a transcript um, into the chat in case the sound quality is not ideal. And I'm actually going to stop the share really quick and then restart it again so that the sound can come through. Um, so I'll stop share and then share screen again and share sound.
Okay, hopefully we'll be able to hear this. If not, I'll try to narrate over the top. to share our science. Uh, today I'll give an introduction of the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, how we contribute to a We were hearing it, Maria. We could hear it. Um, yes, Maria, and, and we, we also have your, your box on the Zoom error coming in the middle of the screen. So now we've lost you again. <laughs> Belene, if you could, would, yeah. would you be able to just play it from your? Yes, I will. Thank I you. Will. Thank you. In my case. Hello. On behalf of my colleagues and I, thank you for the opportunity to share our science. Uh, today, I'll give an introduction of the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, how we contribute to a suite of essential variables, uh, the, just the types of observations we collect uh, to understand the biodiversity of boundary systems, and then some examples where we integrate remote sensing and in situ observations in a seascape framework. The work highlight, highlighted today has been funded by a U.S. interagency partnership, as well as a NASA partnership uh, with the International Group on Earth Observations, including work to support the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goal 14, uh, Life Below Water. Belene, if you could just make that uh, full screen. Let's start with the problem at the global scale. Modeling studies suggest that marine ecosystems will likely face multiple stressors in the decades to come due to climate change. These stressors are likely going to be patchy, but will overlap. So systems will face additive or synergistic pressures. Biodiversity is a first order indicator of ecosystem responses to those stressors. However, baselines are lacking. While the observational record is growing, some regions and some regions are moderately sensed, most of the global ocean is sparsely sampled, if at all. We rarely co-measure the appropriate environmental changes with the relevant ecological responses. And when we do, we tend to treat those biophysical interactions as static. When non-linear as well as non-stationary interactions are common in marine systems, Belene, it appears that the sound has come, uh, has uh, left. Maybe I can narrate over this. <laughs> uh, can you say it again, Maria? It appears that the sound quality of the recording has stopped. Uh, okay, I was listening to it. Uh, oh, you, of course, it's, I mean, of course, it, could I have, be me. it is my laptop, so. I'm not sure if everybody's experiencing the same problems. Could you? You, you may you may need to unmute yourself, Belen, to for us to hear the presentation. I thought it was in the back. Okay, then I, I think uh, the presentation is just paused. Just yes. Press play. No, yeah. yeah, I paused it. Yeah, that I did it on purpose uh, because I I could hear Maria. Okay, so uh, probably I can just go backwards a little bit. No, it's and fine. Just restarted where it is now. Yes, okay. Fashion. Regionally, things like coastal physiography, upland inputs, uh, bathymetry, hydrology, riverine inputs, these all affect the regional signature of climate, as well as our capacity to measure and detect climate change um, regionally. Finally, there's the quality of remote sensing. Adjacency to land, glint by bright sediments, uh, difficult atmospheric correction, and the mixture of different water masses creates complexity and difficulty in transferring or developing um, new remote sensing algorithms. In response to emergence, emerging threats, a marine biodiversity observation um, network demonstration project was competed through um, an interagency cooperative in 2014. Three projects were initially funded um, with, an, with additional projects funded um, in 2019. 
And bond nodes span several ecosystem type, including polar, temperate upwelling, and subtropical ecosystems. Our goals are to build upon, integrate, and synthesize existing information from monitoring programs, including IUS. And indeed, each node is associated with the regional IUS uh, association, which acts as a conduit both for data and communication between partners. Other partners include uh, the Ocean Observing Initiative, Fisheries Surveys, Long-Term Ecological Research Sites, and National Marine Sanctuaries. Another MBOM goal is to define the minimum criteria for observing biodiversity in a dynamic coastal zones. And this includes the development and application of technology for autonomous sampling, as well as to more thoroughly assess the rich taxonomic diversity in these waters. Um, and uh, we also wish to detect and track biophysical and biogeographic change through advanced remote sensing. And that's in essence, a major goal of the MBON is to embed organismal information into ocean observatories at the level to which physical and chemical processes have been monitored um, in the past. And that's uh, for a more holistic understanding of change in coastal ecosystems. MBON remote sensing sits at the intersection of several essential variables, uh, and these include uh, essential climate variables and essential ocean variables from um, Goose, many of which can be obtained using remote sensing. MBON is also involved um, in the development and measurement of essential, essential biodiversity variables, which were developed as part of the group on group on Earth observations. EBVs are biological state variables that um, are sensitive to change, but also ecosystem agnostic to allow for synthesis of regional to global patterns. EBVs cover a range of biodiversity levels from genetic composition, community composition, through to ecosystem structure and function. They were designed to link the primary observations of change, including in situ and remote sensing, to high level indicators of biodiversity and ecosystem services for current man management and future scenarios. Goose biology and ecosystem EOVs were also um, identified recently through an extensive review of societal needs and current state of ocean um, observations. EOVs were selected on how they um, contribute to address societal and scientific issues, but also the impact, feasibility, and scalability of these variables. MBON nodes uh, currently measure and synthesize um, at multiple levels of biological organization that fit within this framework. But um, I'll, as we'll talk about in a minute, we also include um, a habitat uh, state um, uh, of the pelagic environment within our suite of um, measurements. MBON utilizes multiple platforms at multiple scales, including to, uh, including but not limited to ocean color, altimetry, microwave and infrared SST, and salinity in order to advance ecological remote sensing. We focused over the past few years across four general pathways. The first is to advance the accuracy and inclusivity of plankton functional type algorithms. And these include understanding community composition, but also size fraction. We also use higher resolution and lower repeat surveys like Landsat um, to image kelp and things like corals and seagrass in subtropical regions. These are called foundation species. We use multivariate satellite data as inputs to species distribution models, and these include commercially important fish species, but also um, important keystone species like krill. Finally, we utilize multivariate multi-sensor information um, in a seascape ecology ge biogeographic framework in order to assess changes in the extent, quality, and occupation of pelagic habitat. I should say all of these are important pathfinder um, uh, activities for the next generation of hyperspectral, including those on NASA's PACE and uh, surface biology and geology missions. So pelagic seascape ecology is a framework to relate organisms uh, to their dynamic habitat and to objectively track change within and across global marine ecosystems. We classify dynamic seascapes in space and time using machine learning methods and multiple satellite model data uh, time series. We integrate physical oceanographic variables such as salinity, temperature, ice, and sea surface height anomalies, as well as uh, biological variables such as chlorophyll A, dissolved organic matter, and fluorescent line height, which is an indicator of plankton physiology. 
A detail of our method is that the, uh, the method preserves underlying relationships between variables. Thus, the resulting classes shown um, in different color patches in the central uh, panel here represent unique allotropic uh, level responses to physical forcing. It's dynamic, importantly, so seascapes can expand, contract, and move with the motion of the water. Our classification is hierarchical, so seascapes are classified on both global and uh, regional scales. And then at the regional to local scales, we collaborate with partners to survey and census multiple multi-trophic level community composition, but also to investigate patterns of biogeochemistry and habitat occupancy. As the biogeographic framework for the MBON, seascapes provide a means to conduct ecosystem and community comparisons, rarefaction, as well as methodological comparisons. The next few slides, I will highlight where MBON researchers are using seascape framework to integrate multiple types of data to improve algorithms, identify hotspots, and understand the causes and effects of habitat variability. And then I'll wrap it up with some uh, brief mentions of data integration and communication. The figure on the right shows the general flow of information in seascape indicator development. Partner input both validates seascape patterns and refines the, uh, the variables or spatiotemporal scales of the classification, depending on the question or process of interest. This is an iterative and reciprocal process. Plankton groups have different absorption or scattering spectra, lending themselves to space-based ob observations. But coastal water masses also have suspended sediments, dissolved organic synthetic vegetation. This optical complexity makes it difficult to successfully apply uh, global plankton functional type alg algorithms. Through evaluation of pigments and absorption spectra from in situ sampling from across seasons, MBON researchers have determined that satellite derived seascapes are spectrally unique, as well as dominated by different taxonomic groups. This is a step towards constraining the optical complexity in coastal zones as um, and furthers the development of robust regional algorithms. Satellite observations are also being used to determine the extent and dynamics of benthic hotspots in the Arctic. The US Arctic MBON has partnered with uh, the Distributed Biological uh, Observatory. The DBO is a change detection array where both water column and benthic environmental and biological measurements are measured concurrently each year. Here, satellite, uh, satellite seascapes describe unique water masses that are translated to unique patterns of temperature and salinity on the benthos below. Surface seascape state may possibly re represent export potential, but it, ca it also captures the variability in integrated and sediment chlorophyll A, infaunal biomass, as well as infaunal diversity in the benthos. With NOAA's Southwest Fishery Science Center, we've looked at the occupancy and abundance um, in seascapes of several different forage species, including things like sardines, anchovies, and krill. The upper left figure shows the dominant seascape state um, uh, in the California current system, with each color representing a unique water mass. And the time series shows the spatial extent of seascapes on the shelf bound by the coverage of annual rockfish recruitment surveys. In the time series, we can see the sub-seasonal to interannual variability in the total area the seascape occupies. During the marine heat wave starting in late 2013 and persisting through an El Nino, seascape 14, which represents a productive shelf uh, seascape, shrank, and a more oligotrophic seascape expanded into the domain. Our NOAA colleagues determined that when the productive seascape was less prevalent, there was less krill and increased diversity with the influx of warm water species. There was also a strong relationship to a forage habitat compression index developed earlier by Centora et al. When the forage habitat shrinks, larger predators become more fo focused in the near shore, leading to conflict and entanglement risk with the shallow uh, fixed gear fisheries. MBON data integration includes several interactive tools for data storytelling at both global and local scales. This schematic shows the broad data flow from various international repositories into the um, MBON Explorer. MBON also works with site managers and site um, science communicators to develop infographics to display data summaries 
Um, these activities and uh, this integration pipeline supports indicator development of multiple scales from um, things like national marine sanctuaries all the way up to the um, SDG uh, sustainable development goals. Additionally, satellite summaries such as uh, seascapes are housed in easily accessible repositories such as NOAA Coast Watch. Global scale seascape maps and data are stored at weekly and monthly frequencies and end users can preview and subset the data to ingest in their local pipelines. Working uh, uh, with uh, EcoQuants, we've also developed an R package and R Shiny app that facilitates um, uh, access and extraction of these data for the domain of interest. One example of a successful uh, transferable pipeline is the global MBON pole to pole project led by Enrique Montes of the, uh, at the University of South Florida. MBON pole to pole works with early career researchers across the Americas to develop common sampling strategies of marine coastal biodiversity to uh, synthesize data for collaborative research and to ingest um, these data into public databases such as OBIS. Another goal is to increase the capacity of end user scientists to uh, facilitate access and, and manipulation of, of remote sensing data, including satellite seascapes. So to summarize, um, MBON remote sensing tracks ecological change and boundary systems. Our current focus is on uh, developing uh, phytoplankton functional group um, algorithms, uh, monitoring foundation species, uh, monitoring higher trophic levels through uh, species distribution models, as well as tracking um, uh, dynamic pelagic habitat extent and diversity through seascapes. Seascape habitat indices uh, provide a means of integrating multi-platform data, uh, both traditional as well as new technology, which I didn't have a, a chance to, uh, or enough time to talk about today. Um, uh, these indices also provide a means to improve regional model uh, parameterization and provide oceanographic context uh, to some of these longer term um, ecological time series that we partner with. Uh, seascape indices um, uh, can, or and uh, remote sensing indices rather, can be used for marine ecosystem management in coastal, coastal regions. And some of our um, end user partners are uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries, Fisheries Management, Integrated Ecosystems Assessment, as well as uh, for global indicators, including essential biodiversity variables and essential ocean variables. And last, I would just add that our algorithm development, our synthesis and capacity development are ongoing. And so we welcome feedback as well as uh, potential new collaborators. So uh, with that, I'll close and thank you very much. Thanks very much, Maria. And also thank you for sharing your presentation in the chat. Um, I think uh, this is a really nice example of how you can go uh, use the in-situ observation to add value to the satellite, uh, satellite uh, data collected. And then uh, you have a, a nice example as well from the data production to, to the users and the communication effort that you're doing. And uh, it's, it's very inspiring. Thanks a lot. We'll, um, we'll move on now to questions for the presenters. So anyone wants to add a question, just raise your hand or put it in the chat. Thanks. Yes, I would like to suggest that we people would like to speak up and uh, use the camera, etc. That in addition to raising their hands, maybe it's good that they indicate so on the chat because there are so many people that I can't really see all the all the hands. So. Yeah, I would advise you to just to say, I, I'd like to, to intervene, okay? Thanks, sorry. Any questions from the panel, panel members? To the speakers? Sure, uh, Ed, Ed Deborah here. Um, uh, early on uh, in our, uh, in our, um, 
uh, in our presentations, uh, Peter Miller um, from PML UK dropped a message in the chat and, and he had to, to leave earlier. But I thought it was an interesting question um, and, a, and you know, an offer for a contribution. Um, uh, Peter works with uh, identifying satellite ocean fronts and seems like you know, uh, one of the challenges that we have in uh, designing coastal observation systems is, you know, getting more observations and, and hopefully getting more observations through remote sensing as well as in situ. Um, so Peter had noted to me, uh, I'll just read off his thing and then he sent a, a private message. He said he'd be interested in opportunities contrib to contribute uh, his satellite oceanfront techniques uh, for studying surface temperature and color expression of boundary currents. And he, and he dropped a, a message, you know, referring to um, a paper. He's got the DOI there. He he pointed out to me also that um, his measurements uh, can look at fronts at nine kilometer, four kilometer, a kilometer, and even uh, 300 meters in temperature and chlorophyll A. And I was interested in hearing um, if any other folks on the uh, on the call had uh, some contributions or discussions regarding uh, how to how to potentially combine some of these things. So, uh, you know, Marcelo talked about advances in coastal satellite altimetry that could get down to 300 meters. It, it strikes me that um, uh, using those kind of techniques as well as uh, identifying ocean fronts could put our limited um, uh, our limited spatial uh, measurements, in situ measurements from moorings or gliders or uh, ship tracks in a, in a better spatial context. And it, it seems like it's a really powerful thing to do. And um, I, especially when designing new uh, ocean observing systems from the ground up uh, to, to make them cost effective. Anyway, I, a comment and a question, I guess, if, if people want to follow up. And, and like I said, I think uh, Peter's definitely interested in, in contributing to this effort uh, offline. Maybe just a, a comment from the remote sensing point of view would be that uh, I'm, I'm very fascinated by the fact that we have Sentinel-3 flying, which has a, a chlorophyll data and temperature data and altimetry collocated there. And so rather than looking at the grid really directly along the track. Um, so uh, I think that's a source of synergy that then can be combined with, of course, in situ uh, measurements. And uh, um, I think, I mean, the, 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 of course, there are studies around, but I think that the potential of the uh, synergy of the remote sensing sensors on board of the same satellite has not been yet fully exploited for for Sentinel-3. So I think this could be very, very powerful at boundaries, um, as you were mentioning, Edward. And, and Maria, I think I might have stepped on, it looked like you had a very similar point to make in the in the chat. Mar Maria Cavanaugh. Thanks, Ed. No, I, I just I think it's a fascinating um, uh, subject, and I and I wonder too about the just the combination of all of those three, particularly with the, um, within the same satellite, to identify not just fronts through the gradients or the distributions of ocean color variables, but also whether or not that the function of that front, whether or not that front is a divergent versus convergent front, and and then to perhaps even identify it so that you can track the the dynamics um, over time. And, and I guess one other question or one other thought that I had was, uh, you know, to think about other uh, other remote measurements that might be land based. So, for example, HF radar, lo long range HF radar may also be that that combination uh, of velocity measurement, sea surface height measurement, ocean color measurement and front detection might, might give us a lot of spatial context, you know, together with with modeling um, that. Uh, uh, that, that, you know, people are already taking advantage of it, obviously, but, um, I, you know, uh, I have to admit, I, I'm not a member of the ocean satellite community, and uh, my eyes were really opened. Uh, thank you, Marcelo, for your talk to, you know, the, uh, uh, that, that kind of, uh, I think, pretty remarkable within the last 10 years ability to, to look much closer to the coast. 
Thanks. Um, I think we can move on maybe to questions from the audience. Emily said she had a question for me, so I'll be happy to answer it, Emily. Sure. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, the reports that you talked about, the, the or the assessments that have been done on the different boundary current systems. Uh, are those going to be available to be shared, or are those already somewhere on the web? <laughs> There's no report yet. This is our first attempt as a as a reporting <laughs> to to the community uh, through this meeting. But all the presentations and all the webinars are actually that we've done are online. And we still have two webinars to do um, in the next couple of months. And following that, we will, we will uh, draft a report. And the idea really is to, to get to a paper eventually. Um, but this might involve you know, a lot more interaction with, with different groups. So it's on the cards, but there's no documents yet that has been drafted. OK, thanks. Any other question for the other presenters? I, I, I thought the, the, the AC Flux presentation was excellent. Um, and um, was just wondering what the, the status, what the next step is to improve the global atmospheric model. Um, are we looking at uh, changing the sea surface temperature forcing in the models and how, how how can we improve these uh, the representation of these processes in the global models for better prediction closer to the coast? Can I should I say something? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, well, I'm not sure uh, if uh, we can see the coastal things uh, for the whole globe. But uh, anyway, the uh, one important point I believe is to move to the uh, couple system, not on, not just the atmospheric modeling. Even in the, uh, yeah, of course, we know that. The AC coupling is crucially important in the tropics, but uh, in the same similar way, uh, even in the middle latitude, the uh, couple system is crucially important, especially in the boundary current region. So I believe uh, it's very important step to move to the couple system, couple modeling. Thanks. And what, what observations do you need to improve the representation of these processes um, on Western boundary currents? So, yeah, um, for the uh, physical part, yeah. I, yeah, for example, uh, as I showed today, the uh, SST is, of course, very important, even for the just the atmospheric modeling, not the couple couple system, and uh, uh, the uh, very important uh, message from that study is the even in the state of the art SST products, there are uh, substantial differences among the uh, products, and that those uh, differences can affect the uh, atmospheric response. So uh, one uh, important thing is to further, uh, to try to further improve the SST products, I think. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Monaka. I think Tammy had her hands up and after that, Janet. I have a comment related to um, something you mentioned in your talk, Marjolaine. Um, so if Janet's got something related to the point that's just raised, no, okay. Um, so you mentioned there was very little knowledge of the end users um, of the uh, boundary current systems that had, um, that had come out in a lot of the presentations. And I'm wondering because um, 
as I think we all appreciate, these boundary current observing systems are incredibly expensive to initiate and to maintain um, over long periods of time and to, to even develop further. Um, is it perhaps not something that we should look at um, uh, as to try and build up the actual funding base? So instead of only uh, looking at um, the one or two environmental government departments within countries that, that should or could be um, funding these sorts of initiatives is to look further at uh, government departments related to transport or safety and security um, or other uh, entities, end users, um, stakeholders that could be assisting in the initial funding and setup of these sorts of boundary systems. So I was just wondering if there was any thought around that from the colleagues. Um, I've got some thoughts on that, Tammy, which I'm happy to share. Uh, of course, I think the approach is very different whether you are already a, a developed country with an established system and a, a country like, a, like a less developed or less income uh, is available, where the approach would be quite different. And I think for, for countries with, uh, who haven't established a system yet, you know, they have an opportunity to start right at the beginning with the stakeholder assessment uh, and, and contributions. But my, my feeling is that industry should play a bigger role in maintaining the observing system globally, not just in, in developing countries, uh, because they are a, a beneficiary of the system, but we're not able to account properly for it yet, which is why you know, this kind of exercise is important. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't have a system in place, how do you, how do you convince <laughs> uh, people to, to contribute financially? So it's a bit of a catch-22. I think you first need to establish something and then uh, bring uh, develop the trust with the stakeholders and demonstrate you know, the usefulness of some of the things that you do and then build on that and, and, and bring in um, contributions uh, and I think, I don't know the details, but I think that's what happened to, to some extent in, uh, in Australia, where initially it was very much uh, government funded. And then as the system is maturing, they're getting more and more contribution from the private sector. So that's, that's one way that it can evolve. Is that answering your question? Should we, um, Maria, did you want to comment on this? Or did, did, if not, I will ask Janet to, to, uh, to speak, but if, if it's about this matter, maybe Maria, you can also comment. So now just a very short comment. I think that um, one very nice outcome of this activity that we are doing with the boundary systems task team is to, to inform uh, best practices um, for new observing system designs in regions that probably are under sample so that we can also provide new data to support decision making and for the different stakeholders. So I think that um, that could re be really, really good if we can move forward into also moving into areas that are not that uh, heavily sampled or at least so far so that we can really inform uh, different stakeholders and also policy makers because I think that if we can provide data that informs uh, models, uh, data simulation systems for different users, then we can demonstrate uh, much more the value of having new measurements and also including, for instance, testing new technology that are post effective that have been used in other regions and then how that the, those new technologies could be implemented in regions that are under sampled or have never been sampled. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Maria. Um, Janet. Yes, I actually stepped on my own toes when Tammy asked me whether I had something related to the previous issue. And I do, because I'm interested also in, um, you know, wind forcing really plays a huge role in, in Western boundary currents and the connection with the coast, especially. And I wondered whether there were any efforts uh, by the satellite community to uh, to give us higher resolution wind products near the near the coast. That's really something that's missing, and we've heard a lot about. That's a, an issue with the models as well. Uh, 
um, is this for me? <laughs> sure, sure, but sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. Well, in terms of, of winds, well, that's that's uh, um, not really uh, my expertise because I mostly that with winds and 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 uh, and uh, and sea level with altimetry. But um, there are so I don't know. Uh, I mean, in terms of winds from from altimeters itself, then. Uh, um, the, the, the problems of the measurements are the same, so I uh, one would hope that uh, the, uh, pro the 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 product that contains improved sea level and significant wave height at the coast also improves the wind. But in reality, very very little has been done uh, with these remarks, almost nothing. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I I I'm not the right person to answer about the quality of um, wind data from scatterometers. Uh, in the coastal zone at their resolution. So maybe in the audience, there is somebody that it's a more, um, that, it, that it's better off with this. I'm sorry. Uh, just following up on that, Marcello, may, maybe you might, uh, you're also measuring uh, humidity, aren't you? I mean, you, you are measuring other atmospheric parameters with the altimeters, which could be very valuable. Um, are you able to resolve better those parameters closer to the coast now with the the high resolution uh, coastal altimetry. So the work, the products that on which we are focused on up to now, up to the coastal zone, other than sea level, is wave height. So significant wave height has been also significantly improving the coastal zone. Particularly in the next days, there will be the release of version two of the Sea State Climate Change Initiative um, um, product, which is from the European Space Agency, and um, and so. But so those are the, the two, let's say the two quantities that have been uh, improved close to the coast. And the other thing that is missing is that you are probably used to have gridded sea level and significant wave heights product uh, in the open ocean and in the coastal zone, we're not at this level. So there is, uh, up, there is um, no um, gridded combined uh, products um, um, in the global coast. So everything I've been, talk I've been talking about has been made a long track. Um, so uh, in terms of the uh, typical level four products that are um, used in the open ocean, we're still a step back. We are still at the, at the, at the level three. And um, yeah, but it's so the focus up to now, especially in terms of validated products has been on sea level and wave height. That, that's great. But I mean, it's still a long track data that is assimilated in the in the data simulation models. And I'm just wondering if your if some of the coastal long track altimetry products are, have been assimilated in some models with uh, and what impact that may have had compared to the previous. Uh, oh, so I, I think yeah, I think John Wilkin could probably say something about that. There has been a project named Tosca, if I'm not mistaken, where that was a collaboration um, also with a um, with CLS, for example, in uh, in Toulouse, where uh, specifically processed uh, altimetry data have been used or prepared at least for possible data simulation. Um, but this was a step back of the products with respect to the latest innovation which we have in the last years. But John, maybe you are the one who can say something more about the status of data simulation of uh, coastal altimetry data. If John is still there. <laughs> he was there earlier on. <laughs> okay, well, well, I well if, if he's not there anyway, so there has been efforts within the um, um, the coastal altimetry community, together with the um, um, with the Myocean community, the coastal part, which I don't remember right now the name in my mind, um, but um, not yet, at least with the latest product and the latest mission. So this was done a few years ago. Um, so I think definitely that that is a um, a very a very important way to go. Also because I mean I think this is also the right place where to say this. I mean coastal altimetry is only meaningful when done in synergy with uh, an, an observing system. Of course for validation purposes, but also for application purposes. So we were talking before about uh, currents, and you know if you want to get uh, coastal currents just uh, with geostrophy, you don't go very far. So um, uh, that that's that that is definitely 
coastal altimetry can only be useful as a part of a larger coastal observing system. And so this is actually, that's why I'm so happy that that's the right place where to talk about it because uh, it's the only way it can be meaningful. Any, any other question from the participants? If not, I'll follow up on that because um, in terms of, of the coastal altimetry and the current information derived, you know, how useful is that geostrophic approximation when you get very close to the coast? And, and um, do you think there would be plans to, to, to try and maybe do some machine learning or combine uh, the use other, other observation from HF radar or in situ to try and come out with new products beyond the geostrophy. So geostrophy. I'll, I'll pass this to Sung Yong Kim because uh, we were having a conversation in private just about that, but I will just add that one of the potential future mission uh, missions that are, I think, in, uh, in, in preparation where it would be, of course, a competition um, um, for, for the European Space Agency aims at measuring the total current as a, um, a, as a vector. Um, so uh, I think there are efforts in this way that goes beyond the simple concept of, uh, of radar altimetry. But I may, I'm sure Sung can, can say more about it. Right, there are some efforts on European countries. They have, uh, I forgot the name, NASA also, they working on the high resolution current measurement and wave also. And they try to resolve measure scale versus some measure scale observations. And the issue will be how we resolve agiostrophic component from, uh, from altimeter, how we estimate it. So I think it's still up in the air, but I, our group is working on that and we decided to publish a paper, but uh, maybe I can share later on if you're interested. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other question from the, the panel or the audience? We're actually getting close to the end of our meeting because we, we've run a bit late. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say something. Yes. Yoshi. Uh, thank. You. Uh, it is my. I uh, just uh, my comment. Uh, uh, I think it is very interesting that the uh, wind is wind. Uh, um, Majorin says the uh, wind w wind is important. So I think so. And, uh, interesting is uh, uh, Nonaka Masa, Masami Nonaka's talk is very interesting point is that wind is measured on the small uh, isolated island. Uh, if the isolated island is located in the boundary current, it probably it will be uh, very uh, important window information for the boundary current. I think so, uh, such a, uh, such a, uh, a trial uh, experiment is, uh, I think, very interesting. So uh, just my comments, thank you. Thank you, Kiyoshi. I'm afraid we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna, if someone wants to ask one last question or a comment but uh, otherwise we, we're going to have to close this meeting it's been far too short real quick uh, given the interest in a long track satellite measurements and the combination of physical and ocean color measurements um, i think it would be great to establish sustained glider observations to follow these tracks right so i think you could get that combination of in-situ measurements with some subsurface ocean color and internal pressure gradient variability, it, it seems like it's a win-win a, a for uh, validating and expanding satellite measurements. I think this is a very good point. It's, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that there has been, I don't know if there has been some, some efforts in some experiments in this direction, but it's certainly, 
as we were saying before, um, you know, you, you have to find the right um, way to finance this and, uh, and, and coordinating it. But uh, it is definitely something that, for example, is not in the usual way in which uh, um, the space agencies um, finance their validation. Uh, the typical ways uh, in the, for, for the space agencies for an altimeter is that they have a network of key tight gauges and then they check that, that the altimeter they've put in place in orbit um, is working correctly. Uh, but if, if this could be expanded through accepting that you know, space agencies also have to take care of other kinds of validations, um, such as uh, you know, HF radars or, or comparison through gliders, um, that, that would be, of course, um, very useful. But I can imagine it's a, it's, it's a, it's a challenging task to organize. <laughs> Yes, and definitely impossible in Yangala's current. <laughs> you, you won't keep the gliders there. And, and actually, in most of these currents, it's going to be very challenging uh, from an operational point of view. But um, uh, we, ha we have to close this, I'm afraid. Uh, it, we've, we've extended our, our timeline. So I wanted to just thank everyone for coming today and being part of this event and to all the speakers Thanks so much. Your presentation was extremely interesting, and uh, we will use uh, use them to, to provide additional input. Um, and uh, many thanks to our panels, panel members as well for being here today, and those who rose very early as well. <laughs> Thank you, and keep well. <laughs>